Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Thursday evening program. My name is Andrew Dalton. I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And I'm joined again by my friend and colleague, um, Gettysburg ex uh, expert and uh, enthusiast, Tim Smith. And he's been a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg uh, for almost 30 years. He's been historian of the Adams County Historical Society for that long as well. Um, and tonight's program we're really excited about and uh, we're fortunate to have Tim because he is probably the authority on the rocks of Gettysburg. I cannot imagine that there's anyone else on the face of the earth that knows more about the rocks at Gettysburg uh, than, than our speaker here tonight. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of ground and uh, crisscross the battlefield several times over, uh, taking a look at the history of some of these rock formations that you probably have heard of, like Devil's Den, um, and some that maybe you haven't heard of before. And Tim's going to go into detail and show us some really wonderful photographs of these sites. I also wanted to mention we're really grateful uh, to have uh, actually an anonymous donor tonight who is going to match donations up to $300. Um, so we encourage you to hit the donate button if you've enjoyed our programs. Um, just a little bit about the Adams County Historical Society. We are the, the community archives in Gettysburg. We have over a million historic items in our collection that we work to preserve and make available uh, for research um, and hopefully one day for uh, exhibit. We're working on a, a big project to open a new facility um, in the not so distant future. So please stay tuned. And uh, if you have a chance to hit the donate button tonight, it does really help us in our work to keep all these materials preserved and to continue to, uh, to put on these programs. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll get into Tim's program for this evening. Um, and let me just uh, turn it over to you, Tim. Okay, so uh, tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about Gettysburg rocks. And there's a, you know, a lot of rocks around the battlefield and in the Gettysburg area. And there's some rock formations that are pretty well known, such as Devil's Den. Let's go to the next one. Um, I wanted to start, though, by talking about uh, a formation um, uh, northeast of here at a place called Trossel's Quarry. And this area, um, and let me preface this by saying I am not a geologist. So uh, this area is part of the Newark Super Group. And this area, a uh, smaller, is called the Gettysburg Basin. And as part of the Gettysburg Basin, there's a couple formations uh, that are interesting to our area, the New Oxford Formation, and above it, the Gettysburg Formation. And in 1937, there was a contract at the Gettysburg National Military Park where a company was uh, resurfacing and rerouting some of the roads, uh, such as South Confederate Avenue. Um, and they were putting in a, some more modern bridges, one uh, over uh, Plum Run along South Confederate Avenue. And they were um, getting the uh, rocks from Trossel's Quarry, uh, which is not too far from York Springs along Bermudian Creek. And uh, there was a man who was um, uh, working on the project as part of the Department of Agriculture named Elmer Height. And he happened to notice something unusual in one of the rocks they pulled from the quarry, and it was a dinosaur footprint. Um, he announced it to the state geologist and uh, uh, state paleontologist, and they send men out to examine uh, the quarry. Altogether, they found some 40 or 50 uh, prints from three different uh, prehistoric creatures. And um, uh, it made na it got some uh, national attention. Uh, the rocks from the quarry were uh, sectioned off the footprints into slabs, and those slabs uh, were eventually sent to museums and collections uh, across the country. And, uh, Carnegie Institute and um, uh, Carnegie Institute in Pittsburgh has a nice uh, uh, piece of one of the rocks on display in their museum. I saw it not too long ago. I was out there. Uh, the State Museum has a really nice slab with some footprints in it, and uh, footprints were sent to the Smithsonian and um, the um, in New York City to a museum up there. Uh, here's an article from 1937 showing Elmer Height. Uh, on the left there with the glasses, examining one of the footprints. Um, let's go to the next one, next slide. 
Um, you know, that battlefield enthusiasts might know that one of the footprints is actually placed on display in the top of the bridge that they were actually constructing at the time the footprints were found. Uh, and that's on um, oh, South Confederate Avenue across Plum Run at the base of Big Round Top. But the Adams County Historical Society actually received two slabs from the quarry that are, the footprints are just really nice. Let's go to the next one. Maybe we'll see that in, oh, did I, did I skip that one? I must have, I must have skipped that one. So um, go back one. <laughs> so uh, in our collection, we have a, a few slabs that uh, have some really nice detail from uh, uh, the dinosaur uh, footprints also. Um, and you can, uh, at some point, you know, you can visit our collections or, or visit our website. I think we, um, uh, on our Facebook post, I know we put one of the uh, photographs of one of the slabs up recently. Now, the footprints, uh, there are three different types of animals. I just want to mention that uh, the footprints that we have are actually from what a type of dinosaur, you know, it's only a guess because we don't have any bones. We only have the footprints of the dinosaur. They're dated to about 215 to 220 million years ago in the Triassic. And it's probably from a type of dinosaur that's made up from the, a group called the uh, Sauropod. Poor, I can never say it. Uh, Sotoportomorphia. Uh, morphia. Uh, okay. We're not scientists. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it's a ple. It's like a um, a platysaurus. It's, it's kind of a small, uh, you know, herbivore. So um, the other kind of rocks, though, in our area are the diabase boulders uh, that are all over the battlefield, and the formation we call Devil's Den is actually made up of diabase uh, that runs through the area. Um, and according to geologists, this formation is said to date from 201.2 million years ago. And basically, there was a rift in this area and hardened molten magma came up through uh, this rift and formed under the surface. And as their softer sediments and soils erode away, these rocks are continuously exposed and more of these rocks continue to be exposed as time goes by. Uh, let's go to the next one. Here's a kind of a map showing in dark green towards the bottom of the map, the, the, where the York Haven diabase runs through our area. And you can see, of course, Round Top and Devil's Den, a little Round Top and up through Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. So the formation of these rocks is only in an area that's about a mile wide. And it's about 30 miles long from down towards Emmitsburg up towards Carlisle. There's another uh, formation of the same rock a little bit east of us in York County near York Haven. And this type of diabase is known as York Haven diabase. So that's the official name. And again, for the guides who might be listening and want to uh, talk about it, 201.2 million years ago. There's a pretty good uh, book that came out in 2004 by the Pennsylvania Geological uh, Survey, Pennsylvania Geography, and it has an article, and this map is from that, about the York Haven diabase on the battlefield. Let's go to the next one. Um, the article is by a guy named Robert Smith and Richard Keene. And I really liked our article where they tied in the rocks of the battlefield to the actual history of the battle and the fighting. And this quote is how they decided to end their article. And I'm a big fan of it. Years after the Battle of Gettysburg retired, Confederate generals were frequently asked why the cause was lost at Gettysburg. General Pickett is reported to have provided the slyest answer when he said that he had always been of the opinion that the Yankees had something to do with it. Perhaps the York Haven diabase did too. I like that. Of course, these rocks were great for defensive positions on our battlefield. Let's go to the next one. So um, the rocks, besides the fact that they were all over the battlefield at the time of the Civil War, uh, even prior to the battle, local people used the York Haven diabase in our area 
for construction material. Solomon Powers came to this area. He was born in New Hampshire, um, worked in Baltimore for a time. Actually, I think he came here during the construction of the Tapeworm Railroad in the 1830s. And at the time of the battle, he lived on High Street in Gettysburg, and he had a granite yard there. But uh, Solomon Powers also, prior to the Civil War, owned what we refer to today as the Nathaniel Leitner Farm along the Baltimore Turnpike. And behind that farm, there's a hill. Let's go to the next slide, Andrew. And the hill behind his farm is Powers Hill, named after Solomon Powers. And if anybody has been on top of Powers Hill, uh, and you know, um, it's open to the public now, you can go up there. There are quarries all along the side of the hill where huge rocks have been taken out of the quarry or off the surface of the ground. And now, it's obvious that Solomon Powers, when he owned the hill, was quarrying rock from the top of the hill. And then that rock was used as construction material in the town. Many of the houses in the town are brick or they were log. But if you look at the base of those buildings, you'll see large slabs of this York Haven diabase that the locals referred to as Gettysburg granite. And Powers had one of the best and most profitable stone yards in the area. Let's go to the next one. We did have one question um, from Chuck, wondering where the uh, article about from the Pennsylvania Geological Survey, uh, where did that article come from? Um, it's a Pennsylvania Geologist little magazine. And um, I actually bought it at um, the State Museum store in Harrisburg. So you can probably get it from uh, the State Museum. And I just wanted to, for, before you continue, thank, we've had, I think, six or seven people donate already. Bruce, Craig, Barry, Allie, thank you all so much. Um, remember, we do have a special match tonight. So if you want to give five, ten dollars to help uh, historic preservation in Gettysburg uh, of all these wonderful artifacts, photos, uh, things that Tim and I are talking about, uh, you can hit the donate button at the bottom of the video here tonight. Uh, go ahead, Tim. <laughs> so um, uh, it was called Gettysburg Granite. And as early as 1866, Gettysburg Granite made some impact in some other places. Um, I should mention that Gettysburg Granite was used not just for the base of buildings around town. Oh, the Adams County Courthouse has Gettysburg Granite around the base of it. And in the contract, it mentions that Solomon Powers had received the contract for the, the granite around the base of the courthouse, uh, for example. But also, uh, at the time they started to put up monuments on the battlefield, many of the monuments were made of Gettysburg Granite. The Soldiers National Monument partly is Gettysburg Granite, I believe. And the stones in our national cemetery with the soldiers' names engraved in them are made, the slabs are made from Gettysburg Granite. And you can see here, a guy from um, Philadelphia purchased some of the Gettysburg Granite to be used in a monument in Laurel Hill Cemetery in 1866. So um, the people here did well. And not only did the Powers family, well, let's go to the next one. Um, some other granite makers used the granite in this area and were quarrying it and you know, cutting it and selling it. Uh, in this article, Daniel Pittenturf in 1884 um, is, is helping to uh, supply building material for the scientific building at Dickinson College in Carlisle and it's made out of the Gettysburg granite. And I should mention, Daniel F. Pittenturf is Solomon Powers' son-in-law. Yes, he married one of Solomon Powers' daughters, for those of you who know a little bit about his family. Oh, I should also mention that it's called Gettysburg granite. We should put that in air quotes, because it's not granite. It's diabase. And I got to tell you, uh, this, I got a, this story, I, I hope I don't offend any of my friends at the Pennsylvania Geological Survey, but I had uh, some geologists on the tour of Devil's Den, and we were talking about, you know, Devil's Den and the history of the rocks and the fighting around the rocks. That's what I was talking about, not geology. And um, I threw out one of my jokes that I often tell on my tours, you know, diabase is very similar in composition and appearance to granite, but don't take the rocks for granite. And um, oh God. <laughs> no one laughed. I mean, none of the geologists laughed at all when I told the joke. 
And a few minutes later, one of the ge geologists pulled me aside and said, you know, Tim, diabase and granite are not that similar. <laughs> so, um, you know, sometimes you tell a joke, it doesn't really. Not your worst well. joke, Tim. <laughs> yeah, not my worst one. Let's go on. So um, uh, here's an article from 1889. Uh, and I wanted to mention it. Not only did the Powers family live at the Leitner house, which seems to be made out of Gettysburg, you know, rocks from the battlefield, granite, and, you know, the other kinds of other rocks in the area. But um, also, after Powers sold the house to Leitner, uh, here's an article where Benjamin Franklin Leitner, B.F. Leitner, he's the son of Nathaniel, is actually uh, selling granite. And he um, worked on some of the monuments on the battlefield, also B.F. Leitner. And you can see here he's selling um, to the Hinover Borough, a thousand feet of grant, Gettysburg granite crossing stones. And I found another article, let's go to the next one, in the Gettysburg newspaper. I couldn't find it when I was putting this presentation together, but crossing stones were used so that I'd imagine ladies in dresses could cross the street without getting muddy by walking on the stones. And here's a great example. This is the Wagon Hotel at the intersection of the Baltimore Turnpike and the Emmitsburg Road, south of the town. And in the foreground of the photograph, you can see the crossing stones. And I have a specific mention that Leitner put in those crossing stones for the Gettysburg Borough. So it give you an idea of what granite crossing stones might look like. And you no, know, I think the first time I ever saw this photograph, I assumed they're just wooden boards so you could walk across the street, but it makes sense that they're made out of something much more substantial. And of course, I mentioned that there are monuments on the battlefield that are made out of Gettysburg granite. Um, some of the monuments on the battlefield are just made out of the rocks themselves. The Fifth New Hampshire is a great example because the uh, you know, there are stones from various parts of the battlefield put together to look like the core symbol, the Second Army Corps, and the centerpiece is made of made out of the Gettysburg granite. And interesting that people from New Hampshire are using Gettysburg granite on their monument. But uh, um, uh, the 80, uh, let's say the um, 91st Pennsylvania monument, for instance, on the summit of Little Round Top, put up in 1883, is made out of Gettysburg granite. Um, the high watermark memorial, the base of it is made out of Gettysburg granite. And when you um, polish the Gettysburg granite, it looks pretty nice. So monuments on the battlefield are made from rocks taken from around the battlefield, which is fascinating. Let's go to the next one. Now, when I was younger, um, I was really interested in the rocks. And I, I can't tell you why I was so interested in the rocks you know, immediately. I, I think a lot of kids are interested in Devil's Den because you can climb in the rocks, you can play in the rocks, and it's a really cool place. Or snakes hide in the rocks, you know. But I was interested in the fact that the rocks were here during the battle. And, you know, uh, um, my brother and I are up there in the photograph on the left, and Gary Edelman and I are in the photograph uh, uh, at the bottom. And we would go to Gettysburg, we would hang out in the rocks, and we collected photographs of the rocks and we would find the locations of these photographs, which I always found very interesting. And I think it's this, what is here today that was there at the time of the battle? There are very few trees. There's a few houses around the battlefield that were here at the time, but the rocks were here at the time of the battle. And you can touch a rock and know that a soldier also touched that rock. And because diabase is made out of very hard substance and erodes at a very slow rate, the rocks look exactly the same today as they did at the time of the battle. Let's go to the next one. So, you know, here's a Henry Stewart photograph that I acquired from the Adams County Historical Society um, when I, I guess I got in the 1980s. And actually, um, my brother discovered the location uh, of this rock on the slopes of Big Round Top. And I think that. Uh, the caption of the photograph is something like rock on big round top. So we kind of knew it was somewhere on big round top. I didn't put a modern in here, but let's go to the next one. Um, I collected postcards, you know, from around the town that you could buy at flea markets. I remember uh, this postcard, I uh, bought it at a flea market of some guy sitting on top of a rock next to a tree. 
And, you know, and then I just challenged myself to go around and find that rock. And eventually I did find that rock at the base of the little round top. Let's go to the next one. We mentioned in the program on Rock Creek that we gave that I collected photographs of rocks along Rock Creek. I'm still not exactly sure why it's called Rock Creek. But here's some guy sitting on a rock in the creek. And of course, I found that location. I didn't put the modern in, but let's go to the next one. We also talked about the importance of rocks. In this particular photograph, I discovered the location of that rock to the left of the photograph, thereby figuring out that this wasn't a photograph of McAllister's Mill Dam, but of the Saul Mill Dam closer to the Baltimore Pike when it was labeled McAllister's Mill Dam. And uh, so the presence of that rock in this photograph helped us solve a mystery about a photograph. And that's something that I'm not sure how conscious I was of that when I first study, started studying the photographs of rocks. Here's an interesting photograph. I remember challenging Gary Edelman, my good buddy one day to find the location of these particular boulders. And of course, he assumed correctly that it's on Little Round Top and it's a group of uh, people standing um, on some rocks. And he had a little bit of a difficult time figuring out where this photograph was until you realize that in amongst the group of people standing on top of the hill is General Warren's statue, that you're actually standing around the statue. And then it becomes fairly easy to figure out where the view is taken. In this view, General Warren just looks, looks like one of the boys. Let's go to the next one. Uh, William Frasinito, uh, of course, was a mentor of mine. And, you know, I, I'd known him when I was younger. And, uh, you know, his book, Gettysburg, A Journey in Time, is filled with photographs with rocks in them. And he located many of the images because there's a rock in the photograph that alerted him to where the photograph was recorded. But there were many in his book that he had not discovered the locations of. On this particular page in his book, which came out in 1975, there are four photographs. I personally identified the locations of these four photographs by using the methods that I learned in his book and the methods that I was already using myself in my discovery of photographs and rocks. And all these photographs have rocks in them, so that it led me to find the locations. Let's go to the next one. So here's uh, a photograph from 1867. It's a Tyson, uh, C.J. Tyson stereo view of the battlefield. And um, uh, this is the only Tyson view that appears in Miller's photographic history of the Civil War from 1911. So I had access to it in Miller's photographic history. But eventually I brought a, bought a stereo card of it and I could look at it in 3D and I discovered the location in 1993. I think it was, maybe it was 92. But here's a photograph of me. Let's go to the next one. In 1993, at the same site of that photograph. So um, I was able to use that image in 3D and discover the location of the photograph. And then, you know, uh, Frasinito credits me with discovering that photograph in his book. So there's another photograph. Let's see the next one. It's a, oh, it's not yet. So this is a woe drawing. Uh, from the base of Culp's Hill. And later the drawing was converted into a watercolor you see here. Um, I say, oh uh, yeah, I think this is an Alfred Wode sketch. I always get Forbes and Wode mixed up. But we're looking from the base of Culp's Hill to the top of Culp's Hill. And even though it's based on a drawing, that rock at the bottom of the hill is still there. And the rock at the top of the hill is still there. And you can line that up today. Now this, particular view was a Matthew Brady view, one of the four Matthew Brady images recorded on Cobb Hill. And I identified the location of this view based upon that small rock in the foreground of the photograph. Now, granted, I had an idea of where I thought the view was taken. And sure enough, another Matthew Brady view is recorded just looking off to the left here. Um, I also, when I was younger, started collecting photographs with rocks. And here are two photographs uh, that were recorded on Big Round Top. And in these photographs were on 
two sides of the same rock. And these were interesting to me because um, in 1884, um, they opened up an amusement park on the backside of Little Round Top. And they had an amusement park starting a little later at Devil's Den. And so I had an idea that these tin types were recorded at the tin type galleries on Little Round Top or Devil's Den. So I spent a lot of time trying to identify the location of this particular rock because it appeared in so many photographs. The funny thing was, uh, tintype is a reverse image. So I actually had to carry a mirror with me and a tintype and look into the mirror to actually figure out what the rock looked like. Let's go to the next one. So here, I reversed the image on the right. Oh, so you no. can see it. And then of course, you can go out to that same rock, find the rock and, and get a modern photograph there today. And of course, in this view, Andrew is trying to you know, approximate the grumpiness of the guy in the photograph who had his photograph taken. But by locating this rock, I have discovered the location of the amusement park on the backside of a little round top. I don't know how significant that is to the story of our battle, but um, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. And of course, in our Devil's Den book, Gary Edelman and Tim Smith, we have a chapter about the uh, amusement park on Little Round Top and Devil's Tent. Here are two more photographs of that same rock. Um, the one on the left, somebody just walked into historical society with it. I knew right away what, what formation it is. And on the right, I noticed that on the wall at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, it's, it was in a section called the Negro Leagues. And this guy's from Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I believe. and um, um, and there he is in the 1880s in the, at the amusement park at Devil's Den. And they had it at Cooperstown. I told the people at Cooperstown, I don't know if they were as overjoyed to learn the story of the photograph as I was, but um, I, I, for what it's worth, I told them, hey, it's Gettysburg. Let's go to the next one. I just want to say thank you to the 17 people who have donated already tonight. That is so kind of you. We do have a match for uh, up to $300 tonight. We really appreciate it if you can take a, a minute to hit the donate button, 5 or $10 even uh, being matched. Of course, it has a double the effect. So we really appreciate your help um, as we keep uh, working to keep things preserved and protected and uh, continue to put on programs like this. And I want to give a shout out to Tim for actually finding this photograph in a museum in upstate New York and knowing that that rock with zero context <laughs> is a rock on the backside of Little Round Top. Who else could have possibly done that? <laughs> that's right. That, and, and it was really funny because I, I just turned and I saw it and I was like, oh my God, that's that rock from Little Round Top. <laughs> and I don't think that when I told the guy immediately, the curator, he I don't think he believed me until I sent it to another version later. I don't, I think they thought I was out of my mind. So, um, um, here are two photographs of, um, and these are from different collections that I, I got. I think the one on the right might be from the Adams County Historical Society. The one on the left, I bought um, uh, through eBay or one of those uh, web, you know, websites. Uh, but it, this is Devil's Den. They're at the Devil's Den Photographic Studio sitting on a rock. And you know, I took it out to line up that rock. Let's go to the next one. One of my favorite stories of uh, rocks is the rock in the road. Um, and, you know, these rocks are large and they're heavy and they're hard to move. And you have to actually break them up, you know, with a chisel. And, um, you know, it was amazing the story. I'm not going to talk about the story of the occupation of the uh, rock cutter or the granite cutter. But um, for many, many, many years, there was a rock in the middle of the wheat field road. And her two images on the left, one from the 1880s, and on the right, one from the 1890s. See, these two photographs are about uh, 10 years apart, but I kind of spliced, kind of spliced them together. They're not exactly a panoramic view, but you can see that when you came down the wheat field road from the peach orchard to the wheat field, there's a rock in the middle of the road until at least 1898 when the one on the right was taken. And I, I still, one of the great mysteries of Gettysburg Battlefield is when did they move the rock in the road? And that's not a battlefield road too, as uh, some of our viewers probably know. This oh. is a, a road that is a, a local road um, that yeah. was in existence prior to the battle. So why anyone would put a road 
in the path of a giant rock. I guess that's the mystery, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's true. I, you know, um, and in one of our road programs that we did earlier, that I, I don't know, remember, did I show the rock in the road and talk about it? I don't think and, so. Um, no, I talked about the tracing of the road, maybe. But uh, it is a county road. It's still a county road today. We like that because when the roads are closed on the battlefield, this is a county road. And this one's always open. So let's go to the next one. This is a, uh, um, it's called a balancing rock. And we have a few views of this. This is a William Tipton view of it. And the balancing rock, and it, it, it's kind of hard to see in this version, but it's actually three rocks that are on top of each other. And it says they're perfectly balanced. There's a newspaper article about this. And according to the newspaper articles, the caption says it's Wolf's Hill. The newspaper article says it's on Wolf's Hill near McAllister's Dam or near McAllister's Mill, possibly. So it's somewhere near there. And you know what? I've actually walked all across Wolf's Hill looking for this rock formation and I cannot find it. Now, it may be there and I'm just, I just haven't found it yet. Or maybe the balancing rock on the top fell off the one below it and I, uh, that's why I can't find it. But I have not discovered the location of this particular image yet, just for, I thought I'd throw it in there. Go ahead. There's a challenge to our viewers to go out and find that rock. Um, just one question from Nancy, where did they, the rock in the road, where was it moved to? Did, did it just end up nearby? <laughs> Don't know. You know, theoretically, they used it for construction material when they're building a bridge or, you know, something like that they'd reuse. You bust it up and then you use it to flatten the road out a little bit. Now, you know, I've been hanging out at Gettysburg um, on a regular basis since the 1970s. And I'm not, I'm not sure exactly when I met him, but I met one of the Weikerts early on. And I remember that um, uh, his brother lived on Baltimore Street, I think 302 Baltimore Street. And, um, I think his brother's name was Jake Weikert, but this guy, um, he hung out on the battlefield a lot. They said that their father had been a national uh, park guide for the War Department. His job was to stand at Devil's Den. So there were actually guards around the battlefield and he had a little guard shacks. And he told me, he took me on a little round top one day, and he told me that there was this rock on Little Round Top that when the wind blew, the rock rocked back and forth. And I was like, I don't know about that. So uh, we went up a Little Round Top and um, here, this is much later when I'm a tour guide and I'm next to the rock, it's behind General Warren and walk over to this rock. If you walk over to it and push it with your hand, it rocks up and down. This rock must weigh a ton and it's balanced so that you can actually push it and it rocks up and down. That's crazy. And uh, according to other tour guides I asked about it, they said, yes, it used to rock back and forth, but you know, it's settled a little more and now you have to really push it, but it's there. Now, of course, there are rocks on the battlefield that have names. We, we, you know, we refer to rocks by name whether we use terms like, you know, the trough rock or the woad rock in this case, or the devil's bath, or even the formation called the devil's den. We tend to give prominent rocks names. Um, Gary Edelman loves to call this one the woad rock. And of course, sketch art artist Alfred Woad was on that rock. And here's Gary emulating the pose of Al Alfred Woad. And, Here's me and my stylish guide tie. And I like to say that this view right here, uh, I, I'm sure Gary has a version of it also. This was to be our dust jacket, you know, about the Arthur photograph <laughs> for our Devil's Den book. So that's one that we, ha we have and we haven't really shown it that much. Right. I just want to uh, thank to uh, give a shout out to Gary and thank all of our our friends at the uh, American Battlefield Trust for all the great work that they do um, and all of the followers of the American Battlefield Trust that might be tuning in to to watch this right now. Thanks for for joining us tonight um, and thanks Gary for for all you do. <laughs> so um you know near Devil's Den there's a rock referred to as the Troth Rock and it has a trough in it in which there is water 
that is pumped up and over the rock from a spring behind the rock. And uh, there used to be a spring there and it used to be a pump and a hose that, that put water up over the rock and down into the trough. And this photograph, this is actually um, Charles Tyson Tipton, William Tipton's son. And we know that because um, about three years ago, um, Charlie Tipton, one of the Tipton family actually donated another version of this photograph to the Adams County Historical Society, which was identified. So here's William Tipton's son on a horse and he's drinking out of the trough. And if you look in the bottom right-hand corner of the photograph, you can see the shadow of the roof of the photographic studio at Devil's Den where we just showed some tintypes were recorded at. Let's go to the next one. Here's, um, I got this from Michael Warricker. I believe Mike uh, shot this photograph from uh, the Gettysburg National Military Park collection. And it is a, um, you know, carriage, uh, a horse-drawn carriage and two horses drinking out of the trough rock. And you might notice the photographic studio on the right of the view, the roof hanging over. Um, and the trough rock is, it's, the trough is definitely man-made. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of times in the tour books, they said it was, uh, that no one knew how it was there. It was a natural crevice in a rock that fills up with water magically. And no, it was man-made and it was a pump that actually put the water into it. Let's go to the next one. Now, you know, I took this photograph at the time of the um, tree clearing a few years ago, but uh, the trough rock is still there. And it's one of the visible remnants of the amusement park that was once at Devil's Den operated, you know, for a time by William Tipton and prior to him by the Mumper family. Let's go to the next one. So, you know, um, one of the more interesting things, I, I, and, you know, it, it's, I don't know exactly when it happened, but people started to recognize me as like, I don't know, the rock whisperer, like, I could look at a photograph of a rock and I would know where the rock is you know, <laughs> before I actually took the rock, the photograph out to find a rock. And I don't know exactly how that happened, but it's kind of interesting that it happened that way. Um, someone on Facebook who was a friend of a friend of mine actually contacted me and they had this photograph of their relative, their great, great, great grandfather, whatever, um, sitting in front of the rock where he was wounded. Now, um, I thought it was awesome. And a bunch of my other friends at the same time got the photograph from other people. It was one of my uh, guilty pleasures that I was able to, you know, a, a snicker a little bit. I was able to figure out where it was before they were because the guy was on the 148th Pennsylvania and everybody was looking for this rock at the weed field. But I simply looked in, the history of the Pennsylvania Reserves and Bates and noticed that he was wounded on July 3rd, not on July 2nd. And I looked at the date, September 27th, 1910. That's the date of the Pennsylvania Monument dedication. So I'll bet you it's near the Pennsylvania Monument because that's where the 148th were positioned on July 3rd. And sure enough, I went out there and I located the position, position of this photograph and made that family really happy. Let's go to the next one. Uh, I was in the visitor center one day, and this was, I, I, I wanna say this was like in the 1990s. And I was at the desk and someone brought a photograph up to the desk of their great, great, great grandfather and where he was wounded during the fighting. He, he came back at the 1913 reunion and actually um, uh, took a photograph at the spot where he was wounded during the fighting. And these guys came over and said, you know, it's a rock, you know, somewhere on the battlefield. And so I took him out there and I think like 15 minutes later, I discovered the location. Now, granted, I know where the 155th Pennsylvania Infantry was positioned on July 3rd, you know, on little round top. So it wasn't like, a, uh, wasn't that difficult to walk down the hill from their monument to the position of their unit and find where this rock was. And that happens, you know, that we have these really cool photographs of people in front of rocks and learning where the photograph was recorded actually helps you place where the regiment was positioned during the fighting. Let's go to the next one. 
So, you know, the other thing about rocks is um, rock carvings. These hard rocks, actually you can take a chisel and carve your name into the rocks. And Devil's Den uh, was one time co just covered with graffiti, um, painted and carved graffiti. Uh, some of this graffiti predated the Battle of Gettysburg, indicating that locals were actually going down there and there was, it was a picnic grounds prior to the Civil War. Let's see the next one. And so in 1894, the War Department, prior, they owned Devil's Den before the 1895 turning over of the rest of the grounds to um, the um, Gettysburg National, uh, you know, the before it became the National Military Park Commission. I think they got Devil's Den in like 1892 from Samuel Wiley Crawford's family. But you can look at Devil's Den in this photograph and you can see the white blotches on the rock. These are chisel marks made by the War Department to remove the graffiti from the rocks. They said while the graffiti remained, it led people to more, place more names on the rocks and they carefully, according to them, carefully removed the inscription from the rock with a large chisel. And if you know where to look, these chisel marks are still all over uh, Devil's Den. Let's go to the next one. And here, you know, it doesn't really, nothing's ever going to help. You can see that there's graffiti all over this rock. Um, and this is the back of the table rock on the little round top. And for some reason, every time I look at this rock, I think of the Pink Panther. I'm not sure why. Let's get to the next one. But there are rock carvings around the battlefield that weren't graffiti that they were carved in by veterans of the battle. This is near Spangler Spring, and we believe this was done during the 1913 reunion. Augustus L. Coble. I think it's Augustus, Augustus Lucian Coble, maybe, first North Carolina regiment. And his son came back with him and they carved his name into the rock near the position where he fought on July 3rd, 1863. Let's go to the next one. Um, there's a rock on the slopes of Culp's Hill near the 122nd New York Monument, which is directly in the background. And there are two locals carved their name on this rock. One of the Leitners, I think B.F. Leitner's younger brother, and a guy named uh, P. Sox. And this was done in 1871. And you can still see those inscriptions in the rock. Let's go to the next one. Um, there's an inscription on the back side of the 149th New York Monument. And apparently it was a placeholder for the Smith Granite Company who put up the original monument to the 149th New York. That's a long story. There's actually a whole story about the inscription of this rock and this monument that's coming out done by a guy in Rhode Island who lives near the um, Smith Granite Company. But you can see Westerly, Rhode Island, um, 1888, J.E. Thompson, employee of the Smith Granite Company. Go to the next one. Um, of course, there's famous ones that are pretty well known, like David Atchison, the 140th Pennsylvania Volunteers. Uh, it was this was carved into the rock to mark the spot where he was buried. And then later, after they removed his body, then they came back and made it a more formal carving. It's near the site of the John T. Weikert Farm in the northern Valley of Death. Let's go to the next one. Uh, of course, there's a couple nice rock carvings on Little Round Top, like the one uh, to mark the spot where Charles Hazlitt fell. And we believe this one and the next one, let's go to the next one, were both done in 1864 or 1860, early 1865. Colonel Strong Vincent fell here, commanding 3rd Brigade, 1st Division, 5th Corps, July 2nd, 1863. So these rock carvings can be construed as actual monuments instead of graffiti. But again, you know, who am I to say what a rock carving is and what graffiti is? Let's go to the next one. Some of the, um, uh, the, some of the rock carvings are, like we mentioned earlier, placeholders. 
Here's one for the 40th New York Volunteers. And again, there's a photograph of that monument freshly erected, and this inscription is on that rock beside it. So we believe that maybe they carved this into the rock to indicate where it was they wanted to place their monument. Let's go to the next one. Here's the 4th Maine Infantry at Devil's Den, not far from the monument to the 4th Maine Infantry. And again, I, uh, as far as I know, before I started pointing this out, I don't know of anybody who realized that this inscription was in this rock. It was behind a bush. Um, but there it is, and um, probably was a placeholder predating the monument. Let's go to the next one. Um, the elephant rock, you know, we talk about rocks with names. Here's a 1867 photograph, and it does say on the, on the side, huge rock, huge rock. So um, on top of the elephant rock in the Southern Valley, uh, uh, Plum Run Valley, south of Devil's Den, um, there is an inscription, D. Forney, 1849. David Swope Forney. And we know from the 1850 census that he lived in Gettysburg and he was listed as an artist. I wonder what he was doing on that rock in 1849. I'd love to see a painting by this guy. This guy was later a uh, pretty well-known portrait painter, but his father was Samuel uh, Forney and he lived on Baltimore Street. He had a drugstore. It's Ping. Well, it's a Chinese restaurant today. It was Ping's restaurant for a while. Let's go to the next one. I just want to take a minute. Thank you. We've had 28 donors. I want to thank you guys so much for, for your support tonight. It means a lot to us. Go ahead, Tim. So, um, you know, wherever you find rocks, you're going to find scratches or graffiti, if you like to call it that. Here's P. Noel, another rock carving at Devil's Den. And this one missed the, uh, you know, concerted efforts of the government chiselers to remove the inscriptions from the rocks but this one's still there. And it's not far from Smith's Fourth New York Independent Batteries Monument. Let's go to the next one. Um, and here, I just thought I'd throw in here, here's a scratch out. Uh, and you can see where they tried to chisel the name off of the rock uh, and it's 18 something, and you just can't really read what it might be. Let's go to the next one. Uh, I discovered this one well after our Devil's Den book came out. But here you can see an inscription. And um, one of my friends on Facebook actually took the photograph of the inscription and actually highlighted it so you could see it a little bit better. But John Houck, May 18th, 1867. And what's really significant about this, he owned Devil's Den at the time of the battle. So the owner of Devil's Den carved his name in the rocks. And I have no idea the significance of the date, but it, it's kind of interesting that he put the date. Let's go to the next one. There are photographs of rock carvings that we are not sure where they are. This particular rock carving, Thomas Houston, Baltimore, um, is a photograph. The photograph says it's graffiti carved into the rocks above Spangler Spring. And Gary and I have spent many hours looking for this particular rock to find if the carving is still there, but we have not been able to. So there are things that we're always looking for and always searching for. Uh, I found a few years ago, an interesting carving in the barn, the stones of the Rose Barn. And it's, I, I think, um, Howard Henry Wirt, um, or Henry Howard Wirt, J. Howard Wirt's son uh, lived with the Weibel family for a while, which were their, they were interrelated uh, to, at the Rose Farm. And he, um, you might even see it says H. A. Wirt. You can see the E-R-T, very small. And, uh, you know, I knew right away who it was because I knew a little bit about the family who lived there. Let's go to the next one. Um, and, you know, um, Photographs can be used to learn more about the battle, but when they're incorrectly used, um, you know, they harm our interpretation of the battle. So here's a photograph that's pretty famous. Uh, it's the slaughter pen. And there are, you know, various Confederate dead in the foreground of the photograph. Early on, 
this got miscaptioned as the base of Little Round Top. Let's see the next slide. Uh, you can see here in this caption, it says the slaughter pen at the base and on the left slope of Little Round Top. And it was used in Miller's photographic history as the Little Round Top. Let's go to the next one. I thought I had another when it spelled out, it was, oh yeah. So here's from uh, Francis Miller's photographic history, Little Round Top. And people placed this image as being the area where the 20th Main fall on the side of Little Round Top where you drive up the hill. Unfortunately, no one could find that large rock in the center of the photograph. And people who were interested in this would just say, well, you know, that rock was probably where the road is. And the road was built and it, you took out that rock and it's not there anymore. Let's go to the next one. Um, and then there's some other views that were taken around that same area. And these views are all listed in various publications as a little round top. So we have all these dead that were attributed and the text to the right of the photograph talks about the fighting between the Alabamians and the 20th Maine as if these are all taken on the slopes on the round top near the 20th Maine monument. Let's go to the next one. Here's another one. The slaughter pen at the foot of little round top, it's captioned. This is from a 1953 book, I believe. Um, uh, it's on my shelf, I don't remember the name of that. Let's go to the next one. But it all focused on this key rock. And in 1967, William Frasinito discovered the location of this rock. Let's go to the next one. And it all came together in one afternoon when he was walking on the battlefield. Here are photographs of dead in front of some rocks. And you can even see there appears to be a stream in the foreground. And until 1967, no one knew where these images were recorded. Of course, the photographer would have known where he recorded them, but his caption was so vague that no one else understood where they were. Let's go to the next one. Um, this photograph is of one of the same two bodies we saw in the last view in front of a large split rock. Let's go to the next one. Uh, and this view is taken in that same area along what appears to be a rocky stream bed. And again, most people attributed all these photographs to somewhere near a little round top. Let's go to the next one. But what happened was, William Frasinito, good friend of ours here at the Adams County Historical Society, obtained this image. It's an 1870s image um, from the Mumpers. And he noticed the rocks in the background of the view. Let's go to the next one here. And you'll see a distinctive set of rocks there just under where the guy's standing. And let's go to the next one. And you see those same rocks in this view. So let's go to the next one and I put them together so you can see. And you see they're the same rocks. So Fry's realized that he was dealing with the same group of rocks. And in the, in the Mumper view, he thought that they were looking out across the Plum Run Valley. So he went to Devil's Den, started walking up the Plum Run Valley, and he discovered the location of these images in the slaughter pen. And he was extremely happy with himself about discovering the location of where these soldiers had been photographed at the time and the location of the slaughter pen. And then he says it, something very dramatic occurred. He turned to his right. Let's go to the next one. And he noticed, oh, there's the, there's the same view today I just wanted to put in there. But he turned to his right and there it was. That rock was at Devil's Den on the slopes of Big Round Top. And all of a sudden he realized that all these books that had these images saying it was near Little Round Top were wrong and these photographs were taken at Devil's Den. So using the rocks as a guide, he was able to put the photograph in context. And now we know that they're Alabamians at Devil's Den in the slaughter pen and not on the slopes of Little Round Top. Let's go to the next one. And of course, that rock appears in the center of the slaughter pen, famous slaughter pen views looking up the slopes, a big round top. I mentioned all this because I think today we kind of take it for granted that we know where these photographs are recorded. But prior to William Frasinita publishing his book in 1975, not many people knew about this. He didn't tell a lot of people. 
Let's go to the next one. There are actually three images from the same perspective looking up the slopes of Big Round Top. This one, and let's go to the next one. Here's a second one. These can be viewed on the Library of Congress website if you put in Gettysburg and you search for them. You see the rocks at a slightly different angle. And I want to say there's a third variant where there's a guy standing on the split rock or the triangular shaped rock. Let's go to the next one. So what happened was when the park was doing their clearing, um, they actually, I got wind that they were clearing the area around Devil's Den. I contacted the park historian, Kathy George, and along with Kurt Musselman, a good friend of ours at the Adams County Historical Society, we went out there and I, they allowed me to show them some of the things in the photograph I noticed. For instance, in the back of the photograph, I could detect some rocks that are kind of fuzzy here. And let's go to the next one. I'll show what I did. I showed them how these rocks actually matched rocks in the woods at that time. Let's go to the next one. And you can see the same formation of rocks here. You just have to trust me. These are the same. I was able to convince them. And then they knew exactly where to remove the tree line to, to make it appear as it did in 1863. So the rocks in a historical photograph were used to help the park rehabilitate the area to more match more of its Civil War appearance. Let's go to the next one. So here's a couple of views um, that are 1863, Alexander Gardner and his crew, uh, looking from near the slaughter pen at Devil's Den up across the slopes of Little Round Top. We have not begun to tap into the extremely high resolution versions of these views at the Library of Congress to all the detail in the background of the views. And if you blow this one up, you can see breastworks along Little Round Top. It's just incredible. And let's go to the next one. There's another one that's looked, looking a little bit farther to the left. Actually, these two views can be used together as a panorama. Let's go to the next one. You see how I join them and you get kind of a panoramic view of Little Round Top from the parking lot at Devil's Den. And in the left center of the photograph, you can see some distinctive rocks and those rocks are still there today. Let's go to the modern view. And again, these views with the rocks help us understand what the battle look, battlefield looked like. And, you know, again, I, fe I feel like I spent my entire life like preparing to help the park do this by studying where this rock is and where that rock is and what this photograph shows us. So it's fascinating. Let's see what I have. I forgot what I have next. So I think the discovery I'm most proud of is this photograph. And this photograph came from the collections of the Adams County Historical Society. And I saw it here in the 1980s on one of my visits prior to being a volunteer at the Adams County Historical Society. So, and what is really interesting is I saw this view in an album, uh, a William Tipton album. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to take that view out onto the battlefield and to find that rock and line it up? John, Colonel John Wheeler, 20th Indiana Volunteers, killed in action July 2nd, 1863. And I know this is weird, but I was a big fan of John Wheeler, the highest ranking officer from the state of Indiana to be killed in the battle from Crown Point, Indiana. And so what I did, and this is something that I don't think any kids listening here today or any young people can appreciate. I took my copy stand to the Adams County Historical Society <laughs> with my light stand. And I had my 35 millimeter camera with my contact lenses attached and I put it on the stand and I shot an image of this. And then afterwards, I had to take the film out of the, the camera and I had to send the film off <laughs> to some company. And, and then a couple of days later, I was able to get that film. And then I was able to take the photograph out onto the battlefield and find the location of this rock. And sure enough, I did find the location of the rock 
and I publicized it. It's in our Devil's Den book. It's in a book that the park has produced on um, Battle on Devil's Den. And I'm extremely proud of the people visit that location today. And here's something I wanted to end with for the Battlefield Guides. I don't think I've shared this with many people, but there is a rock near the intersection of Sickles Avenue and Cross Avenue. And as long as I've been a guide, tour guides told me that yes, the Confederate soldier that killed Colonel Edward Cross was hiding behind that particular rock. And later I learned that it's the history of the 5th New Hampshire Infantry that has that story. I think published in 1887, something like that. And in the book, it says that Colonel Cross was killed by an Arkansas soldier who was hiding behind a rock at the northwest corner of the current intersection. And of course, that big rock is right there. And then I find this. It's like a 1903 tour book held at the Adams County Historical Society. And it's a photograph of that rock. And it says the rock from which Colonel Cross was killed. So we actually have some early documentation that tour guides around the turn of the century were telling the same story that we tell today. And again, the rocks on the battlefield help us tell stories about the battle and bring the battlefield to life. I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, so we hope you enjoyed the, the program tonight. Um, I just wanted to express complete, you know, surprise that we've had 31 people donate tonight on this video. I'm just blown away by your generosity and your support uh, for, for the Adams County Historical Society. We are the kind of the community archives in Gettysburg. Like I said at the top of the video, we preserve over a million, probably closer to two million historic items. Nobody's ever <laughs> uh, but it's enough to fill several different buildings and we're hoping to get all of it under one roof and out in front of people again. Uh, so every dollar helps us as we move forward toward um, a bigger future for the Historical Society. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you'll, you'll hit the donate button at the bottom if you haven't already. Um, and we're very excited to keep doing these programs for you. We have some exciting videos coming up. Um, actually, we, we're going to be sharing a, a pretty big discovery uh, with you um, in the next week or so. So please stay tuned, like our page on Facebook and visit our website. It's www.achs-pa.org. So thanks again for, for joining us tonight. Um, we will be back with you next week. Uh, we'll let you know as soon as we know what the topic will be. <laughs> um, but we're, we're happy to continue doing this. And I wish you all the, the best uh, health and, and happiness as uh, you go about this uh, uncertain time. But thanks again for your support. Um, and we'll be back with you next week.